blessed to live here with my sweetheart, Ron Miller, for the past 10 years. We have been affiliated with BYU Hawaii all that time. And over the years, we've had the opportunity to hear many devotionals. And over those years, I've thought about how to introduce my sweetheart to you. Sometimes people talk about the person they're introducing. They talk about their past experiences or skills. But I want to share something different with you today. I want to share with you about my husband's heart because he has a beautiful heart. And I think that working with him as students, maybe you don't have the opportunity to see it like I have as his wife. The first thing I want to tell you about my husband is that he has a passion for learning. He reads all the time. But his favorite thing to read are the things of the Lord. A long time ago, before we were married, so I couldn't watch over him and make sure he was safe, he decided to, instead of buying food, he would buy gospel doctrine books and read them and study them. And he, he decided that this was more important to him even than food to eat. So he ate rice and beans while he studied the words of Brigham Young and Joseph Smith. This is something I love about him, his passion for learning. Another thing my husband, Another attribute of my husband is his determination. He um, was raised agnostic. Um, and his family, when he joined the church, he was 20 years old, and his family couldn't understand why he would want to serve a mission. And at the same time, his bishop said, you know, Ron, by the time you're old enough to serve a mission, by the time you've been a member for a year, you'll be 21. And it's not required for 21-year-olds to serve a mission, he said at the time. But my husband decided, he prayed, and he studied his patriarchal blessing, and he thought, and he decided that he wanted to serve a mission. And that determination inside of him was a, a rock, a core that he hung on to. He said he would envision as though he were clinging to the foot of the Savior amidst apathy and opposition. He prepared and served a mission. And he has testified to me over and over again that that mission changed his life. The third wonderful thing about my husband's heart that I want to share with you is he has a charitable heart. When we were students, we had four children um, during our student time. And we lived in a two-bedroom apartment. And we didn't have a lot of money. But we learned about a special program that sponsored children in third world countries. These children didn't have food to eat, a place to live, they couldn't go to school, they didn't have the uniforms they needed to wear for school and usually were dressed in rags. And it was $15 a month that we could sponsor a child. And we decided that even with our meager income, if we wanted to help someone, that he wanted to help someone that was, had even less than we did. This charity has been exemplified to me over the years. Before he does his grades, he gets on his knees and prays, he ponders and worries about each of the students that he works with. And he loves BYU Hawaii, and he loves you. So those three things, as you listen to his talk today, you can think about his passion for learning about the gospel, his determination to live it, and his charitable heart. And as you listen, I know you'll feel the spirit. My sweetheart is truly the best person I know. And so I introduce to you Professor Ron Miller. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, aloha. aloha. I would like to thank all those associated with this meeting, particularly perhaps uh, those who prayed for the electricity to come on. 
but also for the wonderful spirit that comes through the music and from our wonderful wife. My talk today is about gems from Joseph. As members of the church, we have a wonderful blessing to have living prophets, living apostles, people who commune, speak with, understand Jesus Christ and our Heavenly Father in ways that have been unavailable to the world for centuries, if not millennia. I know that Joseph Smith is a prophet of God. I know that BYU Hawaii was established by a prophet himself, David O. McKay. And I'd like to go through some of aspects that come through Joseph Smith, that come through scriptures that he directly received, for example, the Doctrine and Covenants, others he translated, for example, the Book of Mormon, and other inspiration that the prophets have also discussed that come through him. I'd like to give you an example. In Amos 3.7, this is the famous missionary scripture, most of us are familiar with it. In Amos 3.7, the Lord says, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. And often we would stop there and we would continue on with our discussions. However, I remember one time they were, we had an investigator when I was serving my mission in Puerto Rico, and they actually read the verse before, and they said they could no longer be, believe in God. And we said, wait a second, you just read the verse that testifies of prophets, and you read the verse before it, and now you don't believe in God. And they said, it's true, I can't believe in God anymore. Because as the scriptures are in the Bible as translated today, in Amos 3.6, the verse actually reads, shall a trumpet be blown in the city, and the people not be afraid? Shall there be evil in a city, and the Lord hath not done it? And this person said, there is so much evil, I had no idea God was doing it all. I thought he was good. Now that I know that God is evil, then I don't want to believe in God anymore. Imagine to yourself having a testimony of the Bible and coming across this verse, which is the same as the translation in Spanish, which is where the language that I served in. And we looked at that verse, and we looked at the person, and we said, we know God is good, and we know he loves you, and he loves your family. And we looked at this verse, and we looked trying to figure out some way. There were other verses we could cite to him and his family about the love of God. But when we looked in our scriptures, what we saw was the Joseph Smith translation of that exact same verse. In the Joseph Smith translation, there's a single word that has been changed under inspiration from the Lord. And it says, shall a trumpet be blown in the city, and the people not be afraid? Shall there be evil in a city, and the Lord hath not known it? It's a simple word, but it testifies to the prophet Joseph Smith's inspiration under guidance from the Lord to help us understand the scriptures better. I actually met many people in my mission who had read Amos 3.6 without the Joseph Smith translation, who said they couldn't understand God nor that they want anything to do with him because the Bible itself talked about the evil that he did. We were able to show not only the Joseph Smith translation under those occasions, but also testify of the goodness of God in our lives and help them see the goodness of God in their own lives. Of the points that I want to discuss, um, that's the first. This idea that God knows what we need to understand about him, his nature, his goodness, his grace. My second point is there was a time when I was in Washington, D.C., and I was talking to a military historian. And this military historian knew a great deal about Rome, and they knew a great deal about Europe. And they said they had looked in the Book of Mormon, and they couldn't believe what they read. And I said, well, what was it that you read that was so amazing? And they said that they read in Mormon 6, 10 through 15. And this is a long quote. I'll only summarize it. This is when Mormon is looking at the destruction of his people. And he said, and it came to pass that my men were hewn down, yea, even my 10,000 who were with me, and I fell wounded in the midst. And they passed by me, they did not put an end to my life. And when they had gone through and hewn down all my people, save it were 20 and four of us, and we having survived the dead of our people, did behold on the morrow, when the Lamanites had returned into their camps, from the top of the hill Cumorah, the 10,000 of my people who were hewn down being led in front by me, also the 10,000 of my people who were led by my son Moroni, and behold, the 10,000 of Gidgadona, and he also in the midst, and Lama had fallen with his 10,000. And Gilgal had fallen with his 10,000, and Limha had fallen with his 10,000. And Janaim had fallen with his 10,000. And Cumaniha, Moroniha, and Antionim, and Shiblon, and Shem, and Josh had fallen with their 10,000 each. And it came to pass that there were 10 more who did fall by the sword with their 10,000 each. And he said he read that, and he said, as a Roman historian, he said, the Romans, we know their enemies. We know the Egyptians, we know the Parthians, we know the Persians, we know the Gauls. He said, we know the Carthaginians. 
Their armies were structured in armies of 3,000 to 5,000, the Roman legion. He said, you would never organize an army of 10,000 to do a 3,000 person job if you were the one supplying the money to pay the soldiers, nor would you be the one to send a 10,000 person army to fight a 3,000 person battle if you had to feed them, you had to sharpen their weapons, etc. He said, to bankrupt your nation. There's no way, he said, he said, the Romans we know, and their problems were basically three to 5,000 person problems. If you had a bigger problem, you'd put two legions together. And he said, there's no way the Aztecs were fighting people with 10,000 person problems if the Romans themselves had three to 5,000 army problems. I said, I know the Book of Mormon is true. I said, I know Joseph Smith is a prophet of God. And I had no answer for this particular Roman historian. <clears throat> Until later, when I took some Spanish classes at BYU Provo, as part of the classes, you read a remarkable entry into the Aztec city of Tenochtitlan. It's written by a man named Bernal Diaz del Castillo. He was middle management under Cortez, not so high that he felt he had to cover up all the things he did that were incorrect, but not so low that he hadn't didn't have insight. What he wrote in 1568 was about when he, as this middle management person under Cortez, learned about people who were going to attack him during that first encounter with the Aztecs. Quote, Cortez then learned from them more fully about all about the Captain Sicotenga and what forces he had with him. They told him that Sicotenga had many more men with him now than he had when he attacked us before, for he had five captains with him, and each captain had brought 10,000 warriors. This was the way in which the count was made of the followers of Sicotenga, who was blind from age, the father of the captain of the same 10,000, of the followers of another great chief named Masai Akasi, another 10,000. Of the fathers of another great chief, the same number. Of another great Chakike, another 10,000. And of another great chief, Nanquatsoban, another 10,000. And I remember reading this and thinking, 10,000? In the Book of Mormon, this is a throwaway item. No one will get a testimony of the Book of Mormon because they read that the armies are in groups of 10,000. But I remembered what the historian told me about how this was impossible and how in 18, or rather in 1568, this was written down by Bernal Diaz del Castillo. Again, testifying the Book of Mormon, even in the smallest detail, is accurate. And by studying it, we will find truth, truths of the gospel, which are the most important, but also the insights we can receive, knowing that it is all accurate to the smallest degree as written by a prophet of God and translated. In a similar vein, and this is my third talking point, in the book of 1 Nephi, in 1634, we have a verse that says, And it came to pass that Ishmael died and was buried in the place which was called Nahum. In this, they are wandering through the wilderness. They are naming places. For example, Lehi names a river and says, This is the river Laman. And in this area, he says, Ishmael died in a place that was called Nahum. Dr. Kent Brown writes that Nephi preserves few geographic details in the rather spare narrative of his first book. But in one instance, Nephi does pre preserve a local name, that of Nahum, the burial place of Ishmael, his father-in-law. Nephi writes in the passive, the place which was called Nahum, clearly indicating that local people had already named the place. That this area lay in Southern Arabia has been certified by recent Journal of Book of Mormon Studies publications that have been featured and they have featured three inscribed limestone altars discovered by a German archaeological team. Here, a person finds the tribal name NHM, Nahum, noted on all three altars. Such discoveries demonstrate as firmly as possible by archaeological means the existence of the tribal name Nahum in that part of Arabia in the 7th and 6th centuries BC, the general dates ascribed to the carving of the altars by the excavators. So I started this talk with a spiritual insight that the, Joseph Smith gave us through his translation, but that even in the smallest detail, we can look to the scriptures. I remember when I was, before the age of 20, when I joined the church, I believed nothing about the scriptures. When I understood that there was a prophet of God, that there's a Jesus Christ and there is a heavenly father who does love us, and that there is a scripture, the Book of Mormon, that is translated as the most correct book on earth, and maybe you want to study that. Find out what does it say? What does it say about salvation, most importantly, of course? But also, what does it say about life? What does it say about doctrine? What does it say about the people that they're describing and the lives they lend? 
As one example, and this is um, in, at BYU Hawaii, I teach statistics. I teach a statistics class and a multivariate statistics class, among others. There are interesting analyses you can actually do on the scriptures. One of these um, is what's called a word print analysis. A word print is essentially something similar to, although not the same as, something like a fingerprint. If I asked you to write an essay about the sun, your nouns would probably deal with the sun, things dealing with space, dealing with the sun, stars, perhaps the moon, maybe the earth, etc. Your verbs would probably deal with things about the cosmos, maybe light rays traveling. But the words that you fill, these filler words, when you say and, when you say the, when you say a, what you start your sentences with, is something that originally was used to discover items about Shakespeare. When the idea of a word print analysis came, it was essentially part of the history of it is that they tried to find, are there essays, poems in particular, by Shakespeare that could not be identified by other means that perhaps this kind of analysis would help. In the foundation of the United States, there are also a series of essays written called the Federalist Papers. These are written by a number of authors, including Alexander Hamilton, Madison, among others, some of which we know who the authors are, some of which we're not sure who the authors are. This kind of word print analysis was run from a statistical standpoint to see who those authors were, both for the Shakespearean poems to see if they match with him, as well as with the Federalist Papers. When this kind of analysis was run on the Book of Mormon. There's an interesting, very interesting history that I go through in my multivariate statistics course when we discuss this particular kind of analysis. Part of that history deals with when it was first applied to the Book of Mormon, the researchers at, the, at BYU Provo found that there was a distinct structure. What they found is that Nephi and Lehi actually match quite well. So do Alma the Elder and Alma the Younger as do Mormon and Moroni, as you would expect from any father-son pair speaking the same language, learning from each other at the same time. There are also various distinctions. Some of these, for example, come between Joseph Smith and the authors of the Book of Mormon. One thing interesting about word print analyses is they find that if you translate something, you receive the word print of the original author, so that if I translated something, you wouldn't receive my word print, you'd receive what the person who I translated from. But if I wrote something, they have analyses where they would look, for example, at Mark Twain and other authors, and they found that in a word print analysis, even when I tried to sound like somebody else, they could still identify statistically that it was me. So when they applied this to the Book of Mormon, they found that not only, from a study by John Hilton, not only are the authors of the Book of Mormon distinct, but that the structure also holds up. What you're looking at, is an article done by John L. Hilton with a methodology that has been published in peer-reviewed journals looking at the same kind of analysis. What he looked at were, for example, the odds of Nephi being Alma. And when you look at, if you were to look at Harry Potter and look at J.K. Rowling, you would find that Harry Potter, as much as you don't like Snape, that big Severus Snape, he actually has the same word print as Harry Potter. Why? Because it all comes from J.K. Rowling. You can match everything to her. What they find, for example, in the Book of Mormon is the odds of Nephi actually being Alma's voice. The probability is 1.5 times 10 to the negative 14th. He calls this statistical overkill. The odds of Joseph Smith being Nephi is less than 2.7 times 10 to the negative 20th as a probability, et cetera. They also looked at Oliver Cowdery, Salvin Spalding, et cetera. And what they found was that there was no match for Joseph Smith. Now, having prayed about the church, that would be obvious to all of us, but it was nice to see it where a non-member would read this and say, well, wait a second, how can you get around the word print statistical analyses? And the answer is, he didn't. These are authors, he was a translator. One thing that's interesting, and this comes from a talk by Blaine Jorgensen, a popular LDS author. He said that in his discussions with the original group who analyzed this, they said everything was interesting and matched as you would expect. The Jesus Christ of the Book of Mormon matches statistically to the Jesus Christ of the New Testament. Heavenly Father, when he speaks in Doctrine and Covenants and in the Book of Mormon, also matches to the Heavenly Father we read about in the Bible. There was only one item that actually, you, you, it was very hard to match up. And in fact, it was statistically indistinguishable. In Alma 48, 17, there is a verse that states, Yea, verily, verily, I say unto you, 
If all men had been, and were, and ever would be like unto Moroni, behold, the very powers of hell would have been shaken forever, yea, the devil would never have power over the hearts of the children of men. This is the one statistical item they could not distinguish. Captain Moroni, with the flag, in the days of the battles of the Nephites against the Lamanites, is indistinguishable from the words of Jesus Christ. There is statistically no difference between them. Clearly, they were different as people. Clearly, Christ is perfect, and he is our savior, and Moroni is not. But apparently, if you ever get a nasty letter because you ignored someone, because as Moroni wrote to Pahoran, apparently, if Moroni wrote it, it would sound exactly like Jesus Christ would write to you. When you look at Moroni and Jesus Christ, it's true. At least in the way that they speak, there is no distinction statistically between the words they use and the manner of speaking that they would address you with. My fifth point. When I was in high school, I was told there are nine planets. Well, now there's only eight, you know, at least in our solar system. Sorry, Pluto. And there's some controversy about that. They're trying to get it back. And now it turns out it may have eight more moons than we thought. So people, you know, sort of the Pluto group, they're saying, bring that one back. But I was told there were only nine planets. And the universe was empty otherwise. And when we look at the stars, we think, how could they be empty? As a scientist, you would say, but show me evidence. If you were reading the scriptures thousands of years ago, the prophets knew of the many creations of our Heavenly Father, of the world without number that he had created. In Moses 133, the scripture states, and worlds without number have I created, and I also created them for mine own purpose, and by the Son I created them, which is my only begotten. In the scriptures, as well as in some talks by Joseph Fielding Smith, they talk about other people on these planets, children of our Heavenly Father. It's interesting because today, and if you go to the hubblesite.org, there's a statement that basically has been made for a few years now. A few years ago, they were able to statistically detect the wobbling that occurs to a star when a small planet orbits around it. It used to be that our technology wasn't good enough to see this. They would look for a physical darkening of that star as a planet rotated around it in order, or they'd look for something mathematical, the gravitational pull, for example. The estimates now is, and this is a quote from that website, which speaks directly and is the official site for the Hubble spacecraft and the Hubble telescope. Our Milky Way galaxy contains a minimum of 100 billion planets according to a detailed statistical study based on the detection of three extrasolar planets by an observational technique called microlensing. Kailash Sahu of the Space Telescope Institute in Baltimore, Maryland, is part of an international team reporting today that our galaxy contains a minimum of one planet for every star on average. This means that there are likely to be a minimum of 1,500 planets within just 50 light years of Earth. The estimates are that every planet, that every star rather in the universe has at least one star on average which would give us 100 billion stars in our own galaxy and 100 billion galaxies in the known universe. All of a sudden, the scriptures that talk about the creations without end, worlds without number, suddenly become real, not because the science says it, but because anciently the Lord revealed it to his prophets. And he said, do you need to know about salvation? Yes. Can I tell you other things? Do we need to know these other doctrines? Do we need to know these other facts? Probably not. Abraham perhaps asked questions about the cosmos, perhaps Joseph Smith as well. And by understanding the cosmos, they understand the mind of God. But when we read in the scripture something that is mathematically, that is a mathematical statement, we can accept it as true. I'd like to quote you one of the um, hymns that used to give me palpitations when they would sing it when I had investigators at church. That hymn is If You Could Hide a Kolob. I always thought, please not on the day that I have an investigator. It's going to cause a lot of discussions beyond the first one to explain what this thing's talking about. And yes, it is in the hymn book, and I love it. It's actually one of my favorite hymns. Oh, but please, let's sing that on <clears throat> family home evening sometime when we can choose who's going to be there. But I remember when I was looking at these various doctrines, particularly in graduate school, since I've been here at BYU, but in, when I looked at the scriptures and said, these are the word of God, this verse, these verses, and if you could hide a kolob, they may be simply good poetry. And as poetry, they are excellent. As a song, it is excellent. But what if we looked at them and said, if God makes a statement, is it true? 
As an example, in Nauvoo, there was a doctrine of us having heavenly parents in the celestial kingdom. When Joseph Smith approved the hymn, Oh My Father, and that was entered into the hymn book, it was accepted as doctrine by the church as to the nature of our heavenly parents. Let's look at if you could hide a kolob, and let's try to see what the Lord may be saying. If you could hide a kolob, essentially what that's saying is, if you could travel to kolob in the twinkling of an eye, which means if you get there really fast, and then continue onward with that same speed to fly. So in other words, if you can go really, really fast, do you think that you could ever, through all eternity, find out the generation where gods began to be, or see the grand beginning where space did not extend, or view the last creation where God, gods and matter end? In a strict sense, what that hymn seems to be relating is the fact that by traveling at a certain speed, I can actually travel through time as well, either back in time to the beginning or to someplace future in time. In the days of Joseph Smith, under the understanding of Newtonian mechanics, Newtonian physics, there was no idea that time was a dimension that you could travel faster in, slower in, or in any other way, that it's simply, as, I, as Newton described it, time was simply an eternal clock in absolute time, ticking one second for every person, no matter where they were in the universe. Under Einsteinian relativity, we understand that if you approach the speed of light, time will slow down, because time and space, our three dimensions of space, our one dimension of time, are actually related, and we can relate them so well that all of us have GPSs on our cell phones, our satellites have to take this into account, or you'd be driving into Laie Bay all the time if you try to get to here, and that even our basic clocks, internet, all rely on relativity, because we are in motion relative to the satellites, relative to each other, relative to the National Institute of Standards, which sets the time for the United States. And what we find is this statement that's in this hymn, where could you alter time by traveling at a certain speed, is actually mathematically accurate. If you want to slow time down, the estimates are if you were one inch away from the event horizon of a standard sized black hole, time would actually travel 10,000 times slower for you. And the faster you went, if you went at the speed of light, this would be the same as a photon, you would find that time would stop for you. In fact, the photons that we receive, be they from the Big Bang or from the sun, have never aged since they left their place of origin and their creation. It's one of the reasons why scientists like to study them. Could you go back in time? Yes, from a theoretical perspective, this happens only if you can go faster than light. Can you go faster than light? A recent study that came out only last week, what they were looking at is what's called quantum entanglement. It's a complex idea. You have particles that are interacting with each other. No matter how far apart they are, the change is instantaneous. They were able to measure that at this kind of entanglement, the information must pass at least 10,000 times faster than the speed of light in order for quantum, the quantum world to work as we see it today. And what we're talking about in the quantum world is something very, very small. If we get so small, we're beyond atoms, we're beyond protons, we're at the basic units called strings, perhaps, that form the universe. It leads me to the second part of if you could hide a, if you could hide a collab. The verse goes on to say, Methinks the spirit whispers, no man has found pure space, nor seen the outside curtains where nothing has a place. There is an idea based on what is considered, it's called the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. If I can look at your momentum, so how fast you're traveling, the idea is that the more exact I, am, I can be on your momentum, your speed, the less accurate I will be on your location and vice versa. If I can get very close to your location on a very small particle level, the less information I will have about the speed you travel. In fact, what they argue is that there are what are called virtual particles, that because if you knew that there was something that was empty space from a physics standpoint, you would know that there was nothing there, but you would instantly know the velocity would be zero and location would be zero. So this gave an idea back in the 1950s and 1960s. There was a theory they've tested it. If you want to look it up on Wikipedia, it's called the Casimir effect. But what they have found is when they look closely enough at any given empty space, 
what they find is an energy signature, meaning that electrons and positrons are simply appearing and disappearing into what they call the quantum foam. What does that tell you? Any modern physicist, be they believer or atheist, would tell you there is no such thing as empty space. Everything has these kind of particles constantly flitting in and out of existence. We can measure it. We can use it actually for an interesting effect, et cetera. But that this hymn, as I, I remember looking through it from this particular vantage point and realizing it seems to be accurate. And what I don't understand about it is simply because of my limitation, not what the Lord put into it. My next point, which is actually the seventh point, is one that doctrinally I think is very important also. It's one where, again, the Lord gives us insight into what he looks at. If you were a student at a regular university a thousand years ago, they may have known because of the writings of the Greeks that there were some radical rebels who were thinking that the earth rotated around the sun. A few people had calculated that in the ancient days of Greece. Aristosthenes being one of the beginning ones who was thought to have considered the world in this way. But the calendars under Ptolemy suggested, no, the Earth's at the center. If I get an apple, it drops. The sun, I can take you into the Alps, as they would say. And in the Alps, I can sit, I can have a cup of water. If you remember Jurassic Park, when the dinosaur came near, the water began to shake. In the Alps, I could fill up a glass of water, and this was done on occasion by some of the experimenters. And they would say, sit in the Alps with me. Do you see the water moving? You cannot move without having this water flow everywhere. But I can show you that the sun starts in a small village, travels 200 miles, and ends the day in a different, different village. And the water didn't move. Say, so clearly the earth isn't moving, and the sun is moving. If at that day you had read Helaman 12, 14 through 15, where he says, Yea, if he say unto the earth, Thou shalt go back, that it lengthen out the day, for many hours it is done. And thus, according to his word, the earth goeth back, and it appeareth unto man that the sun standeth still. Yea, and behold, this is so, for surely it is the earth that moveth, and not the sun. If you came and said, Teacher, the prophet says it's the earth that moves, and not the sun. And they took you up and said, But here's the evidence. The water doesn't move. It moves when you move, when you make motion, but not during the entire day. The Ptolemaic calendar is accurate to one day in about 400 years. This idea of the sun being at the center and the earth rotating around, they are off by as much as 15 days every year versus a calendar that would say we are inaccurate to one day in 400. They would say your eyes can see, the sun moves, sometimes the microphone. You'd say my eyes can see the evidence, the sun moves around the earth. My experiment shows the water doesn't move, the earth is at a standstill. And if you looked at this, and you said, my physical evidence suggests the prophet is incorrect. Not only would you have been wrong from a scientific standpoint, not only would you have lost perhaps even your own salvation, but today the scientists would look at you and laugh at your ignorance because today we understand with clarity it is the earth that moves and not the sun. Today I've been trying to show you little gems. There are more, but they would have to wait for another day, where everything the prophet says is true. If the prophet talks to you about the nature of the universe, he is accurate. If he talks to you about the nature of salvation, which is the most important thing we will ever learn about or attain to in this life, he is right. If he tells you about how to vote, if he tells you about how your social conscience should take you, he is right, and he will always be right. I know the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is God's true church on the earth. I am grateful for Jesus, for Jesus Christ and for our Heavenly Father. And I'm grateful for Joseph Smith and for the modern day prophets, including President Monson, who is God's appointed spokesman on the earth. And I am grateful to be associated with this great university, which has also been inspired by the Lord and has inspired leaders at its helm. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.